Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, well, okay, LU factorization is where we left off. And uh, I'd like to re uh, remind you all that uh, coming to class in person is is really the best way to do this. Um, when I say I remind you all, I'm speaking actually incorrect, grammatically incorrectly, uh, if you get my point. Because unless I say all y'all, I guess, it's, it's well, I should be speaking in the singular because there's one person in class today. Okay. So... Um, we left out looking at LU factorization, all three of us. And uh, we've done the triangular solve, so you see how that works. Okay. And what's really just of a, well, more of a historical, but also deep theoretical interest is that this algorithm here is the only sparse LU algorithm that is asymptotically perfect, that takes time proportional to the flop count. No other LU factorization algorithms can state that claim, even the one I wrote in backslash in MATLAB. Now, in practice, the one in MATLAB is 10 times faster than this one on large matrices, not on small ones. But there are pathological cases that can cause that algorithm to be slow, which this one avoids. It's perfect because it, it, it does, I mean, we, did, we, knew, we know how to do the triangular solve in time proportional to the flop count. The flop, there are a lot of order n loops. And I should add, too, by the way, I've seen a shocking uh, number of order n loops inside order n loops in some of your projects. Shocking. One is shocking, right? So <laughs> I've seen two or three. Uh, you know, 4k equals 1 to n, and then, oh, let's zero the workspace. You know, put this loop inside here or something absurd like that. Uh, you know, you can't do that. You get n squared. So that's not a sparse algorithm. It defeats the whole purpose of the entire class if we're going to do n squared algorithms, we might as well just use a dense matrix solution and forget about this whole course. So don't, don't do that. So everything else in this algorithm here, except for the sparse triangular solve, uh, is order n. We've got order n work uh, actually here. Yeah, order n work in the spallex because those initialize the column pointers, I believe. I have to double check, but I think, I think they do. Do they? I don't remember. Maybe they don't. Maybe they leave them uninitialized. I have to go back and look. Anyway, certainly this piece right here, either a calic here, which I should have done. I was being a little bit perhaps overly cautious. Or the initialization here. Uh, take order n work. So there's n work that goes on. But if you think about it, if you have a full rank matrix, uh, n is not so bad because you've got to do you, you, you have to do work for every column. Now, you don't necessarily have to do any numerical work for any, any column. In particular, the, the place where this is not asymptotically perfect is if the matrix breaks into, um, uh, well, certainly, for example, if the matrix is diagonal. If, there's di if the matrix is diagonal and there's no work required at all, no floating point work required at all, but it certainly takes order and work to create the data structure the output size. The size of the output is order n. So I guess you could call this algorithm asymptotically perfect because it takes time proportional to the size of the output plus um, n plus the size of the input. You've got to examine your whole matrix plus the flops. Uh, now, this, the sparse triangular solve does not take size proportional to the size of the input because it doesn't even examine the entire input. So this actually is not necessarily reflective of a perfect code. So let's take this out. Um, we do visit the whole input, but in this case, the size of the output dominates uh, the size of the input, so we can ignore it safely in this particular algorithm. But the size of the output, certainly, you, know, you have to spend unit time to create a bit of output. Okay, so there's really no way of avoiding that. And the size of the output is n because the representation of the LU factorization is order n in size, at least omega n because it has n column pointers. 
But if the matrix is diagonal, there's no flops to do at all, right? You just there's no division here. There's nothing that happens. Uh, see, so because the only work that occurs, the only floating point work that occurs is inside the sparse triangular solve. And if in the sparse triangular solve, L has unit diagonal. Okay, so um, so with those extra caveats, the, the algorithm is asymptotically perfect because all the work is done here and everything else is either order N here or order N here, and that's okay. We're gonna tolerate order N because that's the size of the output. This does time, this, everything else is constant work inside the end. So this is all this is all order n. These lines of code are all order n. This is order flop count. We've proven that. Finding the pivot, um, this if this list is empty, it's just total time across the algorithm is order n. But if it's not empty, then it visits every entry in L and U, which is then time proportional to the size of the output. And there's at least one flop per output that has to occur uh, minus the entry on the diagonal because you, you don't have to do work there. Uh, this again is constant time work inside the loop, so that doesn't add any extra work. And then finally, the division by the pivot. This is all constant time work, and it's inside an order n loop, so it's order n. And again, this is time proportional to the uh, number of non-zeros in the output, which for which you did two flops for each of these at least, anyway, or one, uh, one I should say, to do the division by the diagonal right here. I'm sorry, there is a flop. There's a flop, the division. So this very simple algorithm three, fits on four pages plus the sparse triangular solve, which I think is another, um, let's see, the DFS, another three or four pages on the screen. Okay, so it's a very short piece of code. Uh, takes time proportional to the floating point operation count. And we left off looking at the details of this phase right here, I believe. Uh, we looked at um, the final pass here then, let's see, I think I looked at this. We've grabbed the pivot entry out of the x vector uh, and finally accommodate that in the last entry. This is, there, there's, a, there's a subtlety here that's very important, by the way. Okay, remember in chapter two, when we looked at the lower and upper triangular solve, See, that's what you're going to have to do after an LU factorization. You want to solve a linear system, right? So you have to solve LX equals Y, and then UY equals, no, B, I'm sorry, and then LY equals B, and then UX equals Y. That's it. My dyslexia is kicking in this morning. Must be the fog. Uh, so we've got to do an upper and lower triangular solve, possibly with a dense right-hand side. Okay, doesn't really matter. But the point here is that in those triangular solves, I made some assumptions. I said that, well, the row indices of the lower triangular matrix or the upper triangular matrix are not necessarily sorted. But if I look at a column of L, the first entry I see must be the diagonal because I got to know where to find it, right? I mean, you've seen that in your codes. You've said, oh, there's the diagonal. It's sitting right there. And in the, if in the upper triangular matrix, the diagonal entry is the last entry. All of these can be unsorted. And the algorithm works just fine because these are all lin linearly or numerically independent from each other. When you're doing the forward solve by column and the back solve by column, you can do these in any order and you can do these in any order, but you got to know where the diagonals are of these two matrices. So that's why here, we place every entry in the column of U first. We're building the kth column of U, remember? And then the last thing that's done to the kth column of U is the pivot. The other reason why this has to be done last, so there's two reasons why this has to be done last. One, it has to fit the data structure on the output. That's a requirement on the output. The other thing is, too, is this is the pivot search from here down to these two lines as well. We have to find the pivot to know where to put it. See, that's the pivot. And that's the kth. This I know. I could have put this up ahead of time. Well, I don't know what is the kth pivot row, but I know that in the new ordering, it's going to be k. Right? At this point, pinv of ipiv is, is undefined because this row ipiv has not yet been chosen up above. But I know that the kth pivot will be called k. <laughs> 
in the final analysis. So this I could have put up first, I suppose, but I need it to be last in the data structure anyway. But this entry here is not yet computed. I mean, had I needed to, of course, I could have, if I had to have the, the pivot at the top of the column, I could have accommodated that by allocating space for it here first and then filling in the data later, but I didn't do that because I need it last anyway. So it's very convenient here. It's computed last and required to be inserted at the very bottom of the column. So that's very convenient. The column of L is the opposite. This entry right here must be placed at the top and not down here. If you tried putting these lines of code, swapping it down here, thinking, well, it doesn't matter. The column is unsorted anyway. It's unsorted except for the diagonal, and there's the diagonal. Now, note that I do not put k here yet. I know that ipiv is the kth pivot row. I could put k. Right? Why not? Well, actually, it probably could be safe because I'm not going to use it to do the depth first search anyway. OK. But it would cause consternation later on because, see, the row indices of L are all old. An entry in L, if, it's, if, I see, if I look in a column and grab out an entry and ask, who are you, your name, well, if, if, there is no name. If, if this is L and this is the identity and you're right here at the kth step of the factorization and you don't know yet who will be chosen as a pivot down here, then you don't know the row indices here yet in the final matrix L. The only name for this entry here that is stable and consistent is its maiden name, if you will. Right? The name in the A matrix, not the name for when it will be chosen as the pivot, that particular row. These rows, I know their name. I know their final name. But it's too hard to partition the matrix L and constantly go back over it, cleaning it up and saying, I've got old names and new names. And that, right, that just breaks, that would just break entirely. And certainly this triangular solve would be a, a horrible mess. It's now consistent if every row index is referring to the old row index. So that means right here, rather than putting K, IPIV is placed as the row index of the pivot. And the pivot value itself is a numerical 1.0. I probably should have written this out as 1.0, so it's very clear that it's a numerical value, not just an integer. Um, well, that's cool. I can move the little hand around here. I'm very careful. I can, not really. OK. Uh, so finally, the, the other last very important little step here is this little piece, xi equals 0. OK. It's, there's a, there's, it looks like a very simple line of code, but there's some, subtle, there's some deep subtlety to that code. The same thing happens, um, let's see. Uh, no, no, the same thing does not happen here. OK. so. Um, I have a value, I've, I have data scattered into this x vector, okay? But this x vector, this triangular solve, requires on input an x vector which is all zero. So there's a loop assertion, there's an invariant here that says, hey, at the top of the loop, whoops, at the top of the loop, this must hold. x must not be all zero. So the base case of that proof is very simple. There, we're done. It's zero. First iteration of this loop, of the k loop, the outermost loop, x is all zero, because I just made it so. So the base case of that proof is very simple. Now we have to do the inductive step. If it's true here at the kth step, will it be true at the k plus first step? So to prove that, I have to say, well, if I start out with x all zero, I go through iteration loop, at the bottom of the loop, will it be all zero? Right? That's the loop invariant, so that the top of the you know, at the bottom of the eighth, it's all zero. Then at the top of the ninth, it's all zero, to use baseball terminology. Um, sorry if, you're, if you don't know baseball, but baseball has nine innings, and each inning has a, you know, one team plays and the other team plays. And the top of the ninth, the top of the fifth, for instance, is the, is the first of the fifth inning. The bottom of the fifth is the bottom of the fifth inning. 
when the other team is playing. So it goes back and forth, say top of the ninth, and the bottom of the ninth is the last of the game. So anyway, that's what I was using here. They got the bottom, top of the loop and the bottom of the loop. Uh, anyway, I shouldn't have used that analogy, but since I used it, I have to explain it, right? I don't want to leave you in the dark. So x is all zero here. Now let's go through and ask, will x go back to being zero at the, by the bottom of the code? See, I have unfortunately seen very, some very ugly, pathetic statements in here in some project submissions that say, that basically take this line of code and stick it right here. I mean, that is just painful to the core. What am I doing here? I'm trying to teach you sparse matrix algorithms. That is not a sparse algorithm. Okay, please don't do that. I know none of you here have done it. Well, I think none of you here have done it. You have to go back and check, I guess. Uh, so please don't do that. Unless you're debugging, of course. Then that's, you know, development, that's one thing. Or if you just can't figure out how to make it work, at least put a comment here. Look, Professor Davis, I know I'm doing the wrong thing, but I can't get it to work otherwise. At least tell me you know that it's not supposed to be there. <laughs> Please. Okay. So now let's look at this. Well, certainly, at the, okay, so what happens at the, in this code here, x starts out as all zero because it's zero here. And then the triangular solve then places values in x corresponding only to those positions in xi from top to n minus 1. So what we have is a vector x here and a list xi of where from 0 to top, no, I'm sorry, from top to n minus 1. This is a list of indices that point to where in x we have non-zero values. So all we have to do at the end of the day is go back to those precise positions and set them to 0. And that time is asymptotically acceptable because the flop, the flop count will be greater than or equal to the size of the output. Well, unless we fold that piece into here. Every, un, every piece of, of data in here took a, there's, there's a flop associated, there's two flops at least associated with each one in the output x. So I can spend time to go back over this and still have perfect asymptotic complexity. Now, um, at this point, I could have I could have done it here, but I can't do it here, right? There's two pieces of this x vector. There's the pieces of L, there are pieces of U. Pieces of eight, that's Johnny Depp's job. So we have, that was a lame joke, I'm sorry. So now this is what this does here. You see, we're going through the last phase. We're grabbing out those entries that appear in L, but look what I do here, x is zero. So this is doing two work, pieces of work. It's doing for L and for U, both. I mean, if I went back here and did it for U, and did a right back to X here, uh, I could do that. But then all that would enable me to do is to take this line of code and stick it inside the loop and only do it on the L matrix. And that's, that's kind of awkward. And I would actually miss something. I'd have to do it one more time. What, what, what I, I'd still, I would still have a bug in the code, and you tell me what it is. If I set x of i to be 0 here, okay, this is a very subtle thing to observe here. If I set x of i to be 0 here, and I, then I said, oh, well, I've handled that for the matrix u, so let, now I only have to do this for l. Let me put that in here. And my code would fail. Why? What would, be, what would go wrong? Do you see it? Sounds logical, right? Anybody? Here? Okay, if I set x of i to be 0 here, which I'll do in the event eventually at the end anyway, this is that's half the work. So these are entries in L, these are entries in U. So set x of i to be 0 here, because I don't need it anymore. And then down here, I could take this statement and put it inside the, the if statement. Take the assignment of x to be 0 and place it inside here for the column of L. It's the other. Pin yeah, there. right. We're changing pin. The pivot entry would not be cleared because this right here would not clear the pivot entry 
because PIMV of the pivot choice is not yet chosen as a pivot. So this does not clear the pivot entry. This won't clear the pivot entry because now PIMV is chosen as a pivot, P I PIV is chosen as a pivot, and so it'd be, this test would be false for the pivot. So this line also clears the pivot. This clears three things. Right? It clears the non-pivotal columns of L, which is inside this if statement. It clears the pivot entry, and it clears the column of U as well, all three. And if you tried to do the trick, say, well, let me you know, do some work here, and then it's not really so much of a trick, it's just a different. I mean, it, these are the kinds of things right, that, you, that you wrestle with in your code. And this, these are the kinds of things that you realize, you know, why isn't my code working? And you're tempted to go up here and say, well, just set the whole thing to zero and be done with it. Of course, then you've destroyed your code. And the rest is useless. So you got to do things, got to do things right. Otherwise, there's, you know, you've broken the algorithm asymptotically, not just to within a constant. And so, what's the point? Don't outsmart yourself. Yeah, don't outsmart yourself, right? But on the other hand, you know, that it's a very there's some there's lots of places in the code where the code just looks exceedingly simple. Like, how simple can this statement be? But there's some very subtly thought through logic as to why this line of code is where it is. I mean, it, 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 the amount of logic and, and thought that's put into this code is, is tremendous as you've tried, to, and you kind of, I hope, have gotten that picture. As you're working through these codes, you realize there's some deep combinatorial aspects to all of these algorithms that uh, need careful thinking um, to make the combinatorics and the, and, the, and the discrete math part of it work out. So finally, we're all done. So this is, um, and that little, that's a little, uh, that's a bug in the code. See that little dot there? That's, that's the, I cut and pasted the image from the book, from the PDF viewer of the book and pasted it into the slide to get this slide. And I, I, I sliced off a piece of this previous curly bracket. <laughs> okay. Finally, we can, once the K, outer K loop is done, we can finalize L and U. And that, this is what the code ha uh, does here. Um, and I apologize, the indentation here is off a bit as well. These are actually two images slapped next to each other, and the indentation got off a little bit. So this is not the indentation that you should see. You'll notice my indentation is very carefully thought out, very consistent. I don't, you know, style is important. Like, for example, there's a comma and a space here. Well, sometimes you'll see in some people's codes, maybe yours, Oh, it doesn't matter, right? So L comma zero, there's no space. But then the next line, there is a space. But you see, that sets off a jarring inconsistency. You look at the code and it should, you know, if it's the same, it should look the same. So there's importance to stylistic consistency. Pick a style and stick with it. I mean, I like my curly brackets to go right here, matching with each other. That's my style. Other people like other styles. I mean, I tend to put extra spaces. Some people don't like spaces here. Okay, that's fine. Just be consistent. I've seen styles that are all over the map. And it's hard to read your code. And if it's hard to read your code, it's for a person. Remember, code is not just for the computer. Code is for you and me and to communicate your ideas to other people. If other people cannot read your code, it is not code. It's garbage. And sorry, I was about to use another word that also starts with the, the letter C, but I won't. Okay? If you, nobody else can read your code, it is garbage. All right? So pick a consistent style and stick with it. Okay, so the wrap-up. Um, we have to wrap up the, L, the, the pointers for the L and U matrices here. This terminates the last column, right? LP of n equals LNZ, UP of n equals UNZ. LNZ and UNZ, you recall, are walking through, pack, you know, one at a time, tacking on entries to these matrices. So that's what these do. And finally, uh, we go back and grab 
the, uh, the Li matrix. And I'm not really sure why I bother. Why, why do I need to reacquire the Li pointer? That's odd. This line of code here, why did I need that? There's a reason, isn't there? <gasps> no. I reacquire, if it changes, oh! Ah! Yes, that line's important. Okay, here's another little twist. And I know I'm belaboring, my, maybe you think I'm belaboring details, but you've written code and you, you get across these weird errors that occur only straight, you know, certain cases, right? Why? Why do I need that line of code? Li equals L goes to I. Of course, I'm using it here. That's why I get it. But wait a minute. I just got it up here. I've just used it right there. I've just used it here, and I've reacquired it. If I reallocate the space, this changes Li, so I just simply reacquire it here. So why do I need to reacquire Li? N is zero, right. What? N is zero, he says? You mean you worry about factoring a zero by zero matrix? Yeah, try it. MATLAB, the factorization of a zero by zero matrix is a zero by zero matrix. You can do this in MATLAB. It works just fine. Factor a zero by zero matrix. L and U are zero by zero matrices. And if you tried this, if you deleted that code, that line of code, you see this loop right here, you notice up at the, whoops, you notice the, at the very top here, there's nothing, see I don't, I don't, act, I don't acquire the Li pointer because I don't need to because I'm going to grab it here if I need it. But that means that if I have a zero by zero matrix, I've not iterated through this loop at all. The 4K loop does not execute at all. LNZ, UNZ are zero. Okay, everything though else will work. I mean, everything else will fall through perfectly. You'll do no work here. You know, you'll allocate objects of zero size. Now that's another thing I'm very careful about. If you look at my, and this is something that Malik and Free cause failures in. Okay, my wrapper for CS malloc, for instance, if you notice, look at it. It always allocates something of at least one size. Because if you malloc in Unix, in Linux, or in C, I should say, if you malloc something of zero size, you get a null pointer. So you can't tell the difference between a memory failure and a nothing. That's why I allocate something of unit size. Because otherwise I come down in here and say, well, wait a minute, you didn't get it, return null. Okay, so there's lots of things like that that I do to handle those special, those edge cases. And guess what? Bugs live in the edge cases. They, fought, they, they thrive there. <laughs> they live there, they breed in the edge, they grow, they multiply. And you know, add, they never divide and subtract. Bugs can, can only multiply and, and I guess if they divide, yeah, they can divide it by, you know, cell division. They expand. They multiply via division, right? So they just, so, so all of these codes here, malloc is something of size n. Inside my CS malloc code, this is why you should never call just malloc. It breaks MATLAB anyway. Never call malloc in your code. Always call CS malloc because CS malloc calls the MATLAB memory manager, not the Unix memory manager or the Windows Memory Manager, but the MATLAB one. And you don't want to mix and match the two. That's a bad idea. But if n is 0, I malloc something of size 1, 1 double in this case. So there's lots of little things like that that you would just read this code and gloss over, but you might be tempted. It's, you know, I mean, this looks so obvious. So so innocent, this line of code, that you wouldn't even think to know why it's there, and that's why it's there. That's the thing, though. If n is zero, wouldn't LNZ also be zero? 
it would. But you see, that's what this should be. And then you wouldn't do anything in that loop anyway. You wouldn't, but you would then do LP of 0 equals 0, which is exactly what you should do. See, a 0 by 0 matrix, what should it look like? If I have a 0 by 0 matrix, then certainly n should be 0. a n and a m should be 0. a p should be an array of size n plus 1, which is of size 1. And it should have a 0. The a p of 0 should always be 0. And so that's an empty column if you... You know, it, it's always the last AP of N is always the number of non zeros in the matrix. So AP of N now is, is zero. N is zero, AP of zero is zero, right? It all works. And AI and AX are not actually accessed in this case. So these could be zero size. They could be zero size. The problem is if they are null pointers, you might wonder, well, did I try to allocate them and run out of space? So this is why MATLAB does it, and I follow the same logic that says if I have a zero by zero matrix, and I, and I think these will be of zero size, I actually allocate a pointer to nothing, a pointer to a, a double or an integer of size one, and then don't put anything in it. It's a placeholder. It just says that, look, I know and I'm not going to access these, but I know I, was, I created my matrix successfully because all these pointers are non-null. These will not be accessed, but they're allocated anyway. This sounds like a little trivial thing to do, but if you write millions of lines of code, which the MathWorks does, and you worry about these things because you've got 2,000 software developers trying to work together, and they have to come up with a common framework to agree upon, and this is one of them. Might not be the choice I would make, but it's a reasonable choice. I mean, it's a cheap choice, right? There's another choice in, in MATLAB, which I wish they would have done differently. Um, it's very strange, but this, there's a, there's a, in MATLAB, there's a sparse logical matrix. Now, in a logical matrix, a dense logical matrix, the MX get PR points to a matrix where every entry is a car, C-H-A-R. A byte, one byte, not double, but one byte. And it's zero or one for true or false. It's not binary, it's not one bit. But so it's it's one car, so it's easier to access. Which is all a pity as well. But a sparse logical matrix, though, think about it. MATLAB, and it's it's sparse matrix. MATLAB is very careful. It says, I will not store any zeros. They're very persnickety about that. Persnickety. Have you ever heard that word before? You have. Yes? You. What's that? You. From me, yeah, persnickety. Yeah, one word, one, it's not German, is it? No. OK, so uh, they're very careful, very precise about, about, you know, and Germans are precise. So what's the word for being very precise in German? Precise? Precisa. Ich bin precisa. <laughs> okay, so what they do in MATLAB is they're so precise to remove the zeros from their matrix. So what will AX of be in a sparse logical matrix? It will be anything that's non-zero. Well, anything that's non-zero is one. <laughs> so that's a sparse logical matrix in MATLAB. They, they fill the matrix, they fill the X values with ones. It has to be all ones. Of course, it's the pattern I that tells you everything. Personally, I think this is unfortunate. Sparse logical matrices are very useful for storing things like graphs, a binary matrix, right? Is the adjacency matrix of a graph? And I've got graphs in my collection with two billion non z edges in them. Two billion. Now multiply that by, you know, eight bytes each to store the eight edge adjacency it list. That's 16 gigabytes of data in memory, at least. You know, you can't do this on your laptop. What's that? What's it, it what? 
one. Well, okay. this tells you the AX tells you nothing. It's yeah. it's this would be more like two gigabytes. Okay. AI would be 16 gigabytes. This is two gigabytes of ones. Oh golly. Please. And you never look it up, right? You don't need to. You know it's all ones. Uh, that was a mis this that's a mystery to me. Why not just why not just do this, you know? Make it a one byte, <laughs> you know? Then it's not equal in size to the number of non-zeros, and you have to have special cases inside. Think about it. You have to have special cases in the code that maybe you have pe places that, I don't know, it's whatever. You know, that was their decision. I, I, I think it's unfortunate, but that's okay. You know, what's two gigabytes, right? If you're all if you're already spending 16 gigabytes, then two gigabytes, eh, what's two gigabytes of memory? It's cheap, right? Okay, I know that, and then finally, so to wrap up here, we go through all the row indices of L and replace them with the pin function. So take the old index, map it through pin, and get the new index and stick it there. And one thing here that's very elegant that you'll notice is I don't have to walk through column by column. Normally, when you traverse a matrix, you walk across each column, with each, each column, look at every non-zero, you know, da, 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 da. Well, everything you do inside a column is just the same thing. You don't, this, is, this is an entry-by-entry entry computation, right? So there's no, you can just walk through all the non-zeros. Column point, cut a column of, a, of an end of a non-zero, it does not matter. Uh, and then finally, so there's the wrap-up. Uh, I tighten up my memory space here. I spree alloc L. Zero is a special case. It says don't try to you know zero the space out, but just make it so there's no extra space. Because what happens with spree alloc, it reallocates the matrix so that it has um, this many non-zeros or the number of actual non-zeros in the matrix, whichever is greater. So zero just says free you know tidy that pack it pack it in. Um, and there's an interesting side effect to this, unfortunately, that I found when dealing with these 16 gigabyte sized data mat you know, matrices, right? I've had to take the spree alloc out from, from I had to have, I was one, one code, I was importing these 16 gigabyte matrices. They're actually matrices that come from web crawls. So you've got two billion edges in this graph. Each edge then is a hyperlink. And there's about a, I don't know, 100 million web pages in this matrix. So it's a 100 million by 100 million matrix with 2 billion non-zeros in it. And uh, I had a Sprealloc, something like this in my code, and I was only f reducing the space. Now, Malloc is, in Unix, is very careful. If you reduce the space, it always works. It never fails. Because realloc, did I say malloc? No, realloc. The realloc in Unix says, here's a pointer, here's some memory space, change the size. Okay, so if you have to make it bigger, it may have to move it. But if you have to make it smaller, shouldn't that always work? Because the memory manager, if it says, well, is there another place I can put this? No. Well, let me just change the size of this block, make it smaller, and then free the remainder. And if I can't free it, if it's too small to free, well, then just pretend that I made it smaller and just say to the user, look, here's your pointer back. I couldn't make it smaller. Right? That, so it should always succeed. Even if you've run out of memory, a realloc to make it smaller should always work. And that's the case if you run this in C. But if, if you run it in MATLAB, you're not using the, the MX, whoops, you're not using MX malloc, M malloc or realloc, you're using MX realloc. And MX realloc will fail. Because when it tries to make it smaller, it tries to move it somewhere else. I know that not by looking at the code. I am a MathWorks consultant. I have access to proprietary information, but I've never seen their code. Okay, I'm under a confidential agreement, you know, non-disclosure and all this. But you can just tell things by realizing, wait, this just died. And it died right there. And when you're dealing with a really huge problem, it's like, ah, why would it die? Well, that's what must be happening. And the Unix realloc doesn't behave that way. That's why I wrote this this way. It's still useful to leave this in here, okay? Because otherwise, you've got a lot of slop left over in this matrix right here. 
even if this code never triggers. Because what if you did the QR factors, the QR analysis, okay, and LNZ and UNZ are strict upper bounds, but you see they can be really sloppy upper bounds, really big upper bounds, and you only use this piece, this amount of, of L and U, and there's the upper bounds. Are, you really like to tidy up your matrices at the very end. So that's it. I know I've belabored this algorithm quite a bit, but it's really the the culmination. These four pages, okay, it, it, it's, it's like the, the, the crescendo of the whole story of the book, right? It's Oliver Twist, you know, what, what happens in, you know, in Oliver Twist? Does he, at the end of the book, I forget. I'll have to reread it. You know, he finds his family or something like that. This puts it, this ties it all together. But even here, there's some very subtle points that need to, that, if you write code like this for a living, which is what I do, then you have to worry about these things. And you especially need to worry about it if you write code for a living and you want other people to use it and not have to call you every day when it breaks. You know, that's real annoying. You, know, you put some code inside MATLAB, you can't have a million MATLAB users calling you back and saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, uh, this, this gave me a seg fault, and my MATLAB session died, and you destroyed my data because it seg faulted, and I had workspace with data I had collected for a week, and now it's gone, right? I mean, you can't do that to people. You just can't, and you, you just can't say, ah, I don't care, you know, go away. What's that? A lot of people. Why did you do that? Well, why did you do this? Yeah, well, this this see these these are this is an edge case. This this kind of statement right here, of course you would never pass in bracket bracket. But what if you're doing some analysis of some large you've got a 100,000 lines of M file code. You're doing very complex analysis of some physical geometry, some mechanical simulations or something and you've got these parts and these things moving and you've got some all the simulations and partial differential equations flying and and there's special cases right where well what happens if you've got a certain part that's doesn't have that extra degree of freedom that you expected it to have okay and you solve a sub problem and that sub problem now is empty because there's no thing to solve for you don't want to have to have a special case oh well I really don't have anything to solve for so let me just skip it it's much simpler just to let the code do nothing by doing nothing gracefully. You don't have to worry about the edge cases. Let somebody, let somebody else, let somebody else worry about the edge cases, right? And I point the finger too. If anybody at the MathWorks reads this, oh, or I'm sorry, listens to this lecture later on, I'm pointing to you, right? You have to worry about these edge cases so that. The mass of M file writing humanity doesn't have to. That's their job. That's your job. The math works. Right. If you're, I'm speaking speaking directly to the math worker. That's that's what they call themselves, math workers. Um, okay. And uh, and I've been very honored to work with the math workers. Yeah, they're a great group of people. Really a lot of fun, and they, they do great work. I just love their code. Okay, I'm not saying that for them because they're not here, right? <laughs> All right, so that's LU factorization. Um, now, this is not the only way to do LU factorization. I've got five minutes left, so I'm not really going to have time to start. I'm not going to start Chapter 7. Um, Although I should ask, I suppose I should ask if there's any questions about the homework assignment. So I'll, let me, shall I do that? Shall I ask that question? Or shall I not? You can always ask it if you want to. Okay. Uh, I want to talk very briefly about something called the multifrontal algorithm. So this is a right-looking method. Remember I said, oh, right-looking is very difficult because how do you take a matrix 
you've computed L and U so far, and you have to multiply this times this and add it into A prime. You have to add a clique into a matrix, right? If there's you get three non-zeros here and three non-zeros here, then nine entries of your matrix become non-zero. It's a clique in the graph. Gaussian elimination is, in a graph, node elimination. This is also a segue into chapter 7, so let me state this now. Think of the graph of L and U, well, actually not L and U, but think of the graph of this matrix here. L and U, let's forget about because we've computed them already. We don't need them anymore. For a right-looking algorithm, once you've computed L and U, you can throw them away. All you care about is the submatrix. Throw them away and means put them in a data structure and ignore them any, any further. So what's happening in this matrix? So if you have a matrix and you, the first step of Gaussian elimination with no pivoting, let's suppose your graph is an undirected graph and your matrix is thus symmetric. So you're doing Cholesky factorization, but you're doing a right-looking Cholesky. So you have to take this and these nine entries, of course it's symmetric, you only do half of it, but that's it's easier to draw it this way. So what's happening? This is a clique. If this is node 1, 5, 9, and 42, okay, then you've got edges from 1 to 5 to 9 to 42. That's, and then you've got the rest of the graph out here. So Gaussian elimination says eliminate this node. This is going to get very bloodthirsty here. Eliminate that node, but in doing so, add a clique so that my neighbors are now all pairwise connected. See, there's edges all between them. Between any pair of these edges, uh, any pair of these nodes, there is now an edge. So that's Gaussian elimination. So graph elimination is the following. Grab a node from your graph. Look at its edges, look at its neighbors, and add edges to your neighbors until your neighbors form a clique and then take a pair of scissors and cut these incident edges and throw this node away. Graph elimination. You just eliminated a node in the graph, but you've made friends of all your neighbors. And the goal in this graph elimination game, I mean, in, you don't have to pick the first node. You can pick any node. And if you use symmetric permutations, then all you're doing is renumbering the nodes. So the question becomes the following. Number the nodes so that when you grab the first and then the second and the third, that you minimize the total number of edges ever created. That's an NP-hard problem. Which order do you grab the nodes? Because if you grab them in different orders, you, each gr graph, you're, cr connect, you're creating a clique. I mean, each time you grab a node, you create a clique. So you're not sure, it's not like an NP hard problem of finding cliques, right? That's another problem. You're making cliques, you're creating them, but you're creating them in an order, and the order in which you create them has a huge impact on how big all these cliques are. And the sizes of all these cliques, the number of edges you create, reflects then the final number of edges in the L and U matrix, matrices. So you'd like to reduce those to their barest possible, the smallest possible number of non-zeros, because you, you only got 64 gigabytes of memory on your laptop, right? <laughs> or on whatever you wish, right? You don't. So you'd like to you'd like to solve your problem. So you'd like to minimize fill-in. That also reduces work, although there's not exact one-to-one -one correlation between the two. It's very close. And so we need to solve this NP-hard problem, but we're adding these cliques to this matrix. But we're adding them numerically as well, right? This is an addition or a subtraction of these nine terms. That numerical addition does not have to happen right away. I can have two matrices like this, where I've got the old data and the new data that I keep separately. I know that eventually I'll add them together, but I could store them separately. So I could have my original matrix terms here, and then I could say, well, look, my matrix A prime here is my original A matrix with a bunch of sparse dots all over it, plus this clique, and that clique, and this clique, and the next clique, and the next clique, and this clique, and there's my matrix. 
And now anytime I need a row or column, I can thread through and I say, there you are, row. There you are, column. It's a different data structure, but now it's much more suitable to a right-looking method. And that's the multifrontal method now. Look, these are the cliques. And these cliques get related to one another by, guess what? Surprise, surprise, the elimination tree. So I need to quit. I'm at 921. And so I will pick this up next week on Monday. Thank you. So we'll do right-looking method and then go into Chapter 7. See you then.